I'm Liz Faubliss, and this is Currents. One of Brooklyn's bishops joins us from Ireland, where he's speaking at a major church gathering. Plus, we'll get to the heart of the matter with Bishop DeMarcio. When you have a major surgery like that, I think you appreciate life more when you recognize that you uh, maybe could have died. You recognize and, and look at life in a different way. It's and a patriotic celebration at a parish in Queens. The flag is a symbol of the United States of America, and it's a, a, a country that we're very justly proud of. Uh, so I hope that people get a very healthy sense of patriotism. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The 50th International Eucharistic Congress has been underway in Dublin, Ireland for the past week. The Global Gathering aims to promote an awareness of the central place of the Eucharist in the life and mission of the Church, improve our understanding and celebration of the liturgy, and draw attention to the social dimension of the Eucharist. Now amid the liturgical events, the cultural celebrations, catechesis and testimonies, and workshops during the week of the Congress, we are fortunate to find that at one of Brooklyn's own, Auxiliary Bishop Frank Caggiano, Vicar General for the Diocese, is in Dublin. He's scheduled to speak Saturday about a very important topic, evangelizing to our nation's youth. I had the pleasure of speaking with Bishop Caggiano earlier today, shortly after his arrival in Ireland, about the program entitled Youth Space, as well as the event's other relevant themes. Bishop Caggiano, it's very nice to talk to you, finally. Yeah, it's a thank you. It's great. Well, greetings from uh, Dublin. And how long have you been in Dublin, and what's the mood there? Well, I've been here since 9.30 Dublin time, and the mood is very festive. I mean, the, in, the, the two individuals I met at the airport who were kind enough to bring me here to the hotel mm -hmm. um, report that the Congress is going extremely well. The crowds are much bigger than they anticipated, uh, so much so that some of the presenters are doing their talks more than once. And a lot of young people are responding, which is what they had hoped for. And as you just mentioned, Bishop Caggiano, you are there for the International Eucharistic Congress. Can you please tell us about it and, and why it's so important, just to put it in perspective for our audience? Oh, certainly. Well, the Eucharistic Congress occurs periodically. It's every few years in different parts of the world. And it draws the Church's attention to the importance of the Eucharist as uh, the, the enduring presence of the Lord in our midst. And it also gives us an opportunity to um, to recommit ourselves not only to uh, our belief and our devotion to the Eucharist, but the communion of love that flows from it. So it is, uh, although it occurs in a particular country, it really is an opportunity for the renewal of the entire Church, mm -hmm. at least in solidarity and prayer. And here in Ireland, given the fact that they've, the Church has gone through some difficult times, it is especially important as a moment of grace to redirect the church here in Ireland back to what's really essential, which is the Lord's presence, his commitment to be with us, and our commitment to love. And, and, so, you're, giving a, and you're giving a talk on Saturday. Who will you be I, talking with, and am, what will be your message? I am. I'm, I'm very I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I've been here a few times uh, deal, uh, uh, dealing with young people and speaking with them. And tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock I'm going to be giving, I believe it is the last presentation to what they call Youth Space, which is a separate track that's run in the Congress for young people and young, and young adults uh, that parallels what goes on for the general populace at the larger presentations. And my topic is, uh, is the Word of God, uh, the beauty of the Word of God and the ability of the Word to, to feed us. So. I, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm looking forward to it very much. And it's interesting that you bring that up, Bishop Caggiano, because what it does is it shows that there's a fullness to this Congress. You're going to be talking about youth space. There are also discussions about forgiveness and reconciliation, priesthood and the ministry. What other topics and themes do you think are going to be addressed while you're there? And will you be part of those talks? Well, I hope to spend uh, most of the day tomorrow attending some of the workshops and talks myself um, because there is much to learn and I have much to learn. I, some of the other topics I think that are going to be coming up is um, the practical ones, how to outreach to Catholics who are inactive in their faith, uh, music ministry, uh, how to evangelize, and the whole a new evangelization is a key theme here. Uh, many of the workshops are run by individuals who are literally in the trenches, 
doing different forms of ministry to different groups in the church. So a lot of it is hands-on, which I, I, I myself appreciate very much. And some of the keynote presentations are more global. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, I guess my task is to do something a little bit more global on, on, on the scriptures and the importance of scripture. But I think the new evangelization is kind of a theme that runs through just about everything that's going on here. And, and timely. Mm-hmm. And in keeping with that, Bishop Caggiano, you make an interesting point that this is just happening in one country, but it is to spread a message of unity and the new evangelization. How will you, your brother priests and your brother bishops, bring that back to us in the States and help push that forward? In a number of ways. First and foremost, from what we ourselves learn from our participation, mm-hmm. we can bring back to others, like, for example, back home in Brooklyn, to help others to learn the best practices of the churches in other parts of the world. And I think that's extremely important. The other is, quite frankly, it's just the solidarity in prayer. Our ability, my ability, to pray with my brothers and sisters here and come back to the States and continue to pray and encourage others to pray for you know, fellow Catholics throughout the world who are facing unique challenges, each in their own place. There's a large contingent, for example, of African Catholics who are here. And their challenges are very different from what we have in Brooklyn. But nonetheless, their challenges affect us because we're one church and we're one family. So one of the enduring uh, uh, aspects of any Eucharistic Congress is the link in prayer that extends far beyond the closing ceremonies, Mm -hmm. which would be, in this case, on Sunday. Bishop Caggiano, how does this trip compare with your previous trips to Ireland? I understand you've been there quite a few times. I have, and I've been here uh, to uh, outreach to young people. I first met a group of of Irish young people when I was in Madrid for World Youth Day when I gave catechesis, and they invited me to come the year after, which I did for the Youth 2000, which is an ecclesial movement, very active here in Ireland, doing tremendous work. and so I, and now, of course, um, I'm here at the invitation of Archbishop Martin um, to speak, and I look forward to seeing the same individuals. I mean, they, this is about a core of about 45, 50 individuals. They are committed, they're prayerful, um, they, they are evangelizing, they've founded a publishing company to do catechetical resources. I mean, they are just absolutely amazing. They're amazing. And and if that is what the Irish Church is giving birth to, despite their difficulties, I think there's a very bright future here in Ireland for the Church. You have a lot of friends in Ireland. Have you had a chance to reconnect with them yet? I understand you just got there. Yes, I just got there. So the answer to that question is no, but I will this evening. My hope is to see some of them this evening. I'm also hoping to... um, to see the pilgrims from Brooklyn this evening. Father, Father Sauer has a group of pilgrims here for the Eucharistic Congress, and I did text him, and we are slated to meet at 8, eight o'clock. So I'm looking very much forward to seeing uh, my fellow Brooklynite and Queensites <laughs> here in Dublin. As always, we are always so well represented. Thank you so much, Bishop Caggiano. So many Please. important messages there, and we can't wait to hear more about it when you come back to us in the States. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. My pleasure. All the best to you. God bless. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 And stay tuned. There's a lot more ahead. We head into the deep with Bishop Nicholas DiMarcio, and we'll get you caught up on the rest of the day's top headlines. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Liz Faubless. Well, as we just reported, Brooklyn Bishop Caggiano will address young people at the 50th International Eucharistic Congress tomorrow. The festivities have been taking place all week long. Yesterday, the theme was solemn as Irish Cardinal Sean Brady told pilgrims he was ashamed that the church had failed to respond properly to abuse allegations. The Cardinal, primate of all Ireland, told pilgrims in a rain-swept stadium, quote, may God forgive us for the times when we as individuals and as a church failed to seek out and care for those little ones who were frightened, alone, and in pain because someone was abusing them. 
Addressing abuse victims, the Cardinal said that we did not always respond to your cries with the concern of the Good Shepherd is a matter of deep shame. Now, earlier, the Congress Secretary General Father Kevin Doran confirmed that there were a number of abuse victims present at the event in a personal capacity. He declined to identify them, insisting that organizers did not want the victims' presence to be misinterpreted as a public relations exercise. Referring to a large healing stone placed at the front of the altar to commemorate the victims of clerical abuse, Cardinal Brady prayed that one day this stone might become a symbol of conversion, healing, and hope. He also says, and I quote, I hope it will become a symbol of a church that has learned from the mistakes of the past and strives to become a model for the care and well-being of children. Meanwhile, during their three-day Spring General Assembly in Atlanta, the U.S. bishops listened to a plea on behalf of Iraq's dwindling Christian population. Chaldean Auxiliary Bishop Shlemin Warduni of Baghdad called upon the U.S. bishops to press the Obama administration to take steps to protect religious rights in the Middle Eastern country. The cleric from Iraq said the country's Christians are being targeted by Muslim extremists bent on ridding the country of all religious minorities. He claimed that the difficult Christians face emerged only after the 2003 U.S.-led invasion of Iraq, and so he told the bishops, and I quote, as leaders of the church in the United States, you bear a special responsibility toward the people and Christians of Iraq. Also from the bishops meeting in Atlanta, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has reaffirmed by a unanimous vote vote a recent statement of the U.S. CCB Administrative Committee regarding the HHS mandate. The statement, which is titled United for Religious Freedom, describes the bishops as, quote, strongly unified and intensely focused in opposition to the various threats to religious freedom in our day, and explains that the HHS mandate demands our immediate attention. The document identifies three basic problems with the mandate, an unwarranted government definition of religion, a mandate to act against against our teachings and a violation of personal civil rights. And while you may expect hot button issues like their policies against sexual abuse to their campaign on behalf of religious freedom would prompt the deepest soul searching, the act of hiring a chief for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops spokesperson for the first time ever prompted the most intense debate. Parties on both sides want to find a delicate balance that addresses the historic reluctance of individual bishops to cede their own pulpits and the recognition that the bishops have been losing the media war in recent high-profile controversies, including the Vatican crackdown on a leadership group of American nuns. Now, the USCCB has always had a communications department, but it has largely focused on putting out press releases for the bishops and organizing promotional campaigns. Also on the table for discussion, ramping up the USCCB's digital outreach. In Washington, D.C., law enforcement authorities have recovered an original 182-year-old Book of Mormon that was stolen last month from an Arizona bookstore. A suspect, who was known by the owner of the bookstore, has also been arrested and awaits extradition to Arizona. The stolen edition is one of 5,000 printed in 1830 after Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, said he located gold plates in upstate New York that he transcribed in to the Book of Mormon. Members of the faith consider the book to be scripture along with the Bible. It is unknown how many original copies are left. Police say the suspect, Jay Linford, is known to the owner of the Mesa, Arizona bookstore and was in the shop at the time of the theft. And elsewhere, while U.S. bishops try to prevent the government from forcing Catholics around the nation to betray their consciences and violate their religious liberty, another constitutional fight has been resolved in Buffalo. Thanks to a court order, Gregory Owen won't be kicked out of this year's Italian festival for handing out religious material. Now, last year, New York police threatened to arrest Owen for handing out Christian literature on the streets and sidewalks during the annual event. He was ordered to leave the festival, which was free and open to the public after police claimed he was violating an agreement with organizers. The Alliance Defense Fund filed a lawsuit against the city on Owen's behalf. An attorney for the group and the chief counsel with its Center for Religious Expression argued, quote, people of faith shouldn't be threatened with arrest for peacefully expressing their beliefs. Now, as it turns out, the city did not have an agreement in place that prohibited members of the public from exercising their free speech rights protected by the First Amendment. Elsewhere, an extraordinary find at a German library. 
This week, the Vatican newspaper L'Osservatore Romano reported that 29 previously unpublished homilies have been discovered in the Bavarian State Library. The work is said to be that of 3rd century theologian Origen of Alexandria, considered one of the most important and prolific early church fathers. He is also credited with playing a critical role in the development of Christian thought. Pope Benedict XVI dedicated two of his 2007 weekly church teaching sessions to the importance of Origen's life and work. Now, few of his original texts remain, partly because he was condemned by the Ecumenical Council of Constantinople in 553. Well, a study by the University of Tampa examining U.S. tax laws to estimate the total cost of tax exemptions for religious institutions found the U.S. government forgoes as much as $71 billion a year by not taxing religious institutions. Well, atheists say those exemptions on property, donations, business enterprises, capital gains, unfairly favor religious institutions. And the editor of Free Inquiry magazine, which published the article, says the issue of religious tax preference is especially relevant now because the number of Americans living outside any religious tradition continues to grow. Now, Mark Rienzi, he's senior counsel at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, said that Americans made a democratic decision that religious institutions are good for our communities, believers and atheists alike. Now, this is not the first time religious exemptions have been challenged. Since the 1950s, there have been several attempts to quantify religious tax exemptions. Only a handful of legal challenges to those exemptions have failed. Most were unsuccessful. Stay tuned. There's more Currents Ahead. Coming up, we'll sit down with Bishop DiMarcio three years after his heart surgery. We uh, appreciate uh, every day that God gives you and try to use it to best, uh, best uh, use. Welcome back. Well, you might recall that it was three years ago tomorrow that Bishop Nicholas DiMarcio underwent quadruple bypass heart surgery at St. Francis Hospital in Roslyn, Long Island. Now, he's made a remarkable recovery and continues to maintain his very busy schedule. How is the bishop feeling? Our news editor, Ed Wilkinson, asked him just that in this week's Into the Deep. Nice to see you, Bishop. Okay. Thanks for being with us. We're going to get a little personal this week. Oh, okay. <laughs> we want to, we're coming up on the third anniversary of uh, your surgery, your uh, open heart bypass surgery. Right. You look pretty good. Uh, have you made a full recovery? I, oh, I think so, yeah. I recovered from the surgery and um, keep up the exercise, which is important. Um, so uh, I, I think I've done pretty well. I think the doctors are satisfied. So um, we just keep moving forward. Did they ask you to make any adjustments to your lifestyle in terms of diet and exercise? Well, and yes. Like you, you know, you have to be careful with the exercise that I'm doing it all the time. It's really important. Mm. I do about an hour in the morning. As soon as I get up early in the morning, I uh, do the treadmill and elliptical trainer and some weights. And just to keep uh, moving, it's very important. And diet is important. I, you can't put weight on. You really have to. I lost about 40 pounds from the high point. Mm -hmm. And I put a few ba back on, I have to try <laughs> to get rid of them. But uh, that's very important, too, for your general health. How about your, uh, your own pace? I mean, you keep a pretty good pace. Do the doctors tell you to slow down at all? Or? No, they, there's no restrictions on the, F, on the uh, activity. But again, you have to be sensible. You can't be dead tired and expect to, to feel good uh, mm -hmm. after that. But there's quite a bit of a demanding uh, uh, schedule that that happens and uh, it's physically demanding also so you need sure. to be in good physical shape to be able to keep it up yeah after the initial surgery and you were released you actually had a little setback there we got a little scary there for I a while. did I had some clots uh, that developed after that which happens sometimes after surgery and I was fortunate to, able to get back to the hospital in time they were able to deal with that and uh, so thank God I'm here mm -hmm. Now, you prayed to a, uh, a certain uh, patron, I think, didn't you? Well, I you know, had this experience from uh, Monsignor Quinn that, you know, when I had returned to the hospital, kind of an emergency situation with the clots, I uh, started to think about him. I had this presence, and I was kind of really out of it, you know, really was, was very sick. But I had this uh, experience that I was thinking about him. I don't know why, you know, I was praying to him. I said, you know, you want to help me? I would, and he did, you know, really was. So and I mm -hmm. really had a... Kind of a moving experience about that, and uh, I, I do attribute to his intercession that yeah. uh, I was I came through all right. I know you still keep a, uh, a photo of Monsignor Quinn in yes, your office, a framed do. photo right, there. Right. And, uh, 
Because uh, how is the process moving? We're trying to... Well, uh, I just got a letter today from the, the postulator, Monsignor Jervis, who said, you got to move this along. Uh, we're <laughs> going too slow. So I think we got to move it along. <laughs> He's anxious to do <coughs> things, and there's other people that have to do things, and uh, it's been a slow uh, situation. But I think we will move it along after his uh, little mm -hmm. nudge. How about your own attitude toward life and daily living? Do you think it's changed at all? Or? Well, I think so. When you have a major surgery like that, I think you appreciate life more. When you recognize that you uh, maybe could have died, you recognize and, and look at life in a different way. It's a good experience in some way you uh, appreciate uh, every day that God gives you. Mm -hmm. and try to use it to best uh, best uh, use. Yeah, and you were at uh, St. Francis Hospital, which is a pretty good institution. Right, right? out and, uh, Long Island, yeah. Yeah, do you uh, have to check in with them? And uh, Yeah, every six months there's a every checkup on the, with the cardiologist. Mm -hmm. And I, I, like I said, I, you look great, and okay. uh, you know, we're grateful to uh, to the doctors and to Monsignor Quinn uh, yeah, for, okay. for bringing you through. <laughs> so uh, thanks so much for sharing with You're us. You're welcome. And I know this also happens to be your birthday weekend, so we yes. wish you a happy <laughs> birthday, right? Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank, thanks All for being right. with us today. All right. And we add our birthday greetings to Bishop DiMarcio and wish him good health for many more years. Up next, waving the red, white, and blue coming up. When we return, it's an annual tradition at One Queen's Parish, a celebration of the Stars and Stripes. We do it every year to tell the kids a little bit about the flag and to really honor local people. And finally tonight, Independence Day, July 4th, is less than a month away. It's a day when we celebrate our country's freedom and an opportunity to put our patriotism on full display. But another occasion that is perhaps not as celebrated but is no less important is Flag Day, when it's all about the stars and stripes. At One Queen's Parish, though, it's a big event involving everyone from the students to the very first post of the Catholic War veterans. We headed to Immaculate Conception Parish in Astoria for yesterday ceremonies. Today we celebrated our 13th annual Flag Day ceremony held here at Immaculate Conception, sponsored by our Knights of Columbus, and we do it every year to tell the kids a little bit about the flag and to really honor local people. Today we honored Major Joseph Fanning who attended here our school many years ago back in the 60s. Well uh, the, the flag is very very special to to everyone. That flag has, has been on battlefields uh, from uh, the, the, the start of, of our nation's history and uh, there have been many men, men and women who have uh, paid the, the ultimate sacrifice uh, defending that, that flag. It's an important day to not only the country, but to uh, everybody that uh, loves America and fought for it, defended it, and uh, died for it. And some that uh, we have as MIAs missing in action that are never recorded or never, nobody ever knows where they're at. But God does. We invite a family, which is today uh, the Fanning family, a uh, student that was here in the eighth grade went to Vietnam, his plane crashed, uh, no recovery has been made, and uh, we're honoring his wife, remembering her uh, for her sacrifices while he was he's still missing. This is our family church. My father and mother both grew up in this church. My grandmother um, was the secretary in the rectory for almost 40 years, so having my father honored here is is sort of a homecoming. It, it's very emotional for all of us. It's a nice closure to my father's story. We want to bring that history back. And honoring the veteran is one of the best thing we could do here at the school. This is the Catholic War Veterans Post, number one, with their church. And the school is attached next to the church. It's very important that we carry that history and that sacrifice has to be acknowledged by us. <laughs> people have an experience of their love for their country. The flag is a symbol of the United States of America and it's a, a, a country that we're very justly proud of. Uh, so 
I hope that people get a very healthy sense of patriotism. I think it's wonderful. It is such a sweet, innocent thing that, that they're learning an appreciation for what the flag really means, what this country really means, and, and, and the freedoms that these people have fought for and have died for. And I hope it stays with them as they grow up. And we want to wish God's blessing on all our veterans and send prayers for the men and women who have made the ultimate sacrifice serving our country. Well, that is all for tonight. Be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. We are also on Facebook and on Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Faubless. We end tonight's show with more from yesterday's Flag Day ceremony at Immaculate Conception Parish. Thank you for watching and have a good night.